We have Concord grapes growing in our backyard. They were here when we came. The old wood is huge and it's sent out branches and vines that have intertwined with the foliage all over the yard. The sweetness of the Concord grapes reminds me of my favorite sandwich, peanut butter and jelly, which reminds me of Holy Communion, which reminds me of the Olympics. Today we're going to see how all three are connected. Hello, my name is Pastor David Burkadal. My wife, Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these videos, Streams of Living Water, to provide a sense of connection for all of us during this pandemic, when we tend to be somewhat more isolated than we were, uh, and an opportunity to reflect on what it means to be a Christian during this time of COVID-19, its uh, aftermath and its variants, and then coming back and forward, and now as we try and figure out what kind of new normal we're coming to. My wife and I are both retired clergy. We have between the two of us over 80 years of ordained ministry experience. Next Sunday will be the fifth Sunday in a row that the theme of the gospel reading for the day in churches all over the world will be bread. One of my favorite lunches is centered around bread. It's a sandwich. It's made with fresh whole wheat bread, though a nicely uh, double-baked rye with caraway seeds, seeds is good. Inside the sandwich is extra crunch, crunchy peanut butter with Welch's grape jelly on it. That's the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now, Welch, I have to say, is no relation to my wife, Reverend Sally Welch. I like the texture of the bread, the earthy substance and crunch of the peanut butter. And though I've mostly lost my sweet tooth over the years, I like the sweet freshness of the Concord grape jelly. Mm. In John chapter 6, verse 51, we see Jesus speaking, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus is the food that everybody knows, bread. But bread will only feed us for this life, physical bread. Jesus gives us the bread of life that will endure forever. Himself, Jesus Christ, crucified. The text that follows takes us into deep water and surface currents of metaphor in verses 52 through 57. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, whoever eats me will live because of me. So what are we talking about here? The Jews refer to the Jewish leaders as everybody around Jesus was Jewish. The leaders argued among themselves about what Jesus was saying, and with good reason. The early Christians were accused of cannibalism by their ignorant or hostile opponents. Even today, Christians in places where Christianity is newly forming are accused of the same thing. We know that the forms of bread and wine in the sacrament or sacred event of Holy Communion don't chemically change as, even as Jesus is present in, with, and under the forms of bread and wine. But whatever we believe about the mechanics of Holy Communion, we believe it is Holy Communion. We commune with the one true Holy God begun and commanded by Jesus Christ. In this sacrament, as 16th century church reformer Martin Luther writes in his small catechism, we receive forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation. For where there is forgiveness of sin, there is life and salvation. If eating and bread and drinking wine did that, we'd have a lot of saved people in this world. But it is not just eating and drinking. Luther says, it is not eating and drinking that does this, but the words given and shed for you for the remission of sins. 
he puts those last words in bold. These words, he says, along with eating and drinking, are the main thing in the sacrament. And whoever believes these words has exactly what they say, forgiveness of sins. When we eat the bread in whatever form and drink the wine or the grape juice, we receive something incredible. We receive forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. God is present in the forms of bread and wine so that we receive these things. We commune with God. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, these words he uses when making an official authoritative pronouncement, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. What does Jesus say he came to bring in John 10.10? 10? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Life, abundant, eternal life. Bread, peanut butter, and jelly make a great sandwich. As with many sandwiches, however, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, especially when the meal comes with memories. Jesus commanded us to do this for the remembrance of me. The presence of Jesus in Holy Communion comes not only with memories, but with the living, present reality of Jesus right now. Remembrance brings the past to the present. It is communion with God for forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. All these things together are present in these forms of bread and wine that we eat as Jesus' flesh and blood, a metaphor for the very life that, that is in God for you. This text from John concludes with the words of Jesus, in verse 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus' presence is not a metaphor. It's literally Jesus present in the forms of bread and wine, even though we are eating flesh and blood. The bread of the, an the ancestors of the Jewish people that they ate was manna. It was a dew-like substance that would spoil in a day that God gave to the children of Israel to eat after he had liberated them from slavery in Egypt and they wandered in the desert. They learned that God would provide for them and they learned to trust God in the giving of this food. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven that lasts forever. The Tokyo Summer Olympics have been going on now for a while and ended yesterday. There were many medal-worthy performances and exciting competitions, and there were gold medal commercials, I thought. The ad with a Paralympic swimmer was my favorite. Maybe you saw in the news that a study of a thousand people, Americans, said that, yeah, they could compete in the Olympics. They, they were in shape to compete in at least one event, uh, winter or summer. Uh, maybe they were all thinking of curling uh, maybe they thought that they could finish an Olympic event. I, I could buy that. Maybe they were not aware that the Olympics have qualifying standards. Or maybe it was just a test to look for the delusional. The ancient uh, Olympic Games began in 776 BC and they ended in 393 AD. They were a big deal and Olympic sports would have been familiar to Paul. Athletes didn't compete for medals, but for a crown of olive or laurel leaves. That's where our expression for honors of laurels comes from. Paul refers to Olympic sports more than once in the New Testament, but I'd just like to highlight one from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. 
Notice that Paul didn't describe athletic events from the point of view of a spectator, but as a participant. When we go to the altar to literally, and I mean literally, commune with God, our only attitude can be humility and gratitude. We are receiving forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation as gifts. We can only respond to God's gifts with worship. Worship. So in Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher and theologian, once reflected on people who go to church mainly as spectators and sit there as if they were at a movie or a play. They expect to get something. But that, he said, is consumerism, not worship. The question to ask, Luke, Luke Kierkegaard said, when worship is over, is not, what did I get out of that, but how did I do? There are a lot of people in the LA area and every one of them needs to be fed, or they will die and that death will be final and eternal. I like PB&J, but it will perish, and no matter how many I eat of them in the meantime, I'll get hungry again. There's a lot, there are a lot of Christians in the LA area who all regularly need to be fed by God's word and sacraments. The good news is that though we too will die, our eternal life has already begun in baptism. And in fact, in a sense, we have already died in our baptism. We are nourished at God's holy table, and we receive God's word gladly whenever we gather. Everything else is a response to these gifts, including most of the time we spend together. We gather to receive the bread of life, and we get spiritually obese unless we live it and worship God in response to what God has done for us. D.T. Niles, the Selenese, or today's Sri Lankan evangelist, ecumenical leader, and hymn writer, once said, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Church reformer Martin Luther said almost the same thing. We are all beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. Let's think about that for a minute. The evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Does that language seem too harsh? It's certainly not popular. But that's all we can do when we share our faith. We can't point to ourselves, but we point to the source of life. Jesus, the bread of life. It's Jesus, the bread that came down from heaven and will endure forever. Do we think of ourselves as fully deserving of our salvation because we are basically good people? Or do we see ourselves as beggars, as sinners, deserving only punishment, but receiving only grace from a loving God who died on a cross in order to reconcile humanity through the living relationship that only the one true living God can give. A PB&J sandwich will nourish us for a limited time. Holy Communion is communion with God in the present and is an appetizer for the eternal feast that is to come. We live and work like an Olympic athlete in response to what God has given us at the cross, an imperishable crown of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Receive these gifts from God and respond to God with a life of worship this Sunday and every day forever. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us into a living relationship with you, the one true living God, and that you nourish that relationship with yourself. You feed us with yourself. You give us strength to carry on and move forward and point others to where they might likewise find nourishment for life, eternal life in you. We bring before you the, the requests that have been made known to us for Dean George Pandua and our brothers and sisters in Christ in Tanzania, particularly in the new church at Takawa, for pastors and church leaders moving us into the new normal, for peace in the Middle East, for an end of the pandemic, and for the tragedies at our borders that they might come to an end for healing for Jeffrey, for Heather and Sean's ministry, for comfort and peace and the sure and certain hope of resurrection unto eternal life, for the families of all those who have died of COVID-19 and other causes in the past year and a half. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, today let's also remember to pray for all those who have yet to get the vaccine, who are most at risk and who are most at risk of putting others at risk. 
let's get to that point where we can move forward and know healing and wholeness as a people who, who have done all the things that God has given us to do. And let's remember to pray the Lord's Prayer today, the one that Jesus taught us. If you don't know what that is, contact us at the Revs David and Sally at gmail.com or send us a tweet to at David Burkadal and we'll include them in our prayers. Send us your con suggestions or any concerns to those addresses and we'll look at every one. As always, we encourage you to stay hydrated, to allow the living presence of the Holy Spirit the streams of living water, a metaphor we find in both the Old and the New Testaments for the Holy Spirit, to form you, shape you, nourish you, to push you, if, if that's what you need, into a life that truly is life, to see God, to, to experience, encounter God in Scripture and in Holy Communion, to know God through our baptisms, that, that we have been given a new life, we are a new creation, we are born again, we have been given a do-over by God, and let's live with gratitude in response to all those gifts of God. Remember your church, if you don't have one, ask a friend or relative, look around, pray about it, do some research, visit a worship service. Many now have either outdoor or indoor worship services. Find the place that God is calling you to be and be there. Fully support it as you would as a, as a person who is already a member. If you're already a member, support your church, pray for its leaders. Give of your time, your treasure, and your talent to make sure that church is accomplishing all that God has equipped that church through you, partly, to be. Remember to uh, reach out to someone if you're having thoughts of suicide or struggling with mental health issues. Call a friend or relative, Google a hotline, uh, go online, find people who are professionals, or just ask a friend. There are people all around you who will walk through this dark time with you into the light that is coming and I know you will emerge into that light from this dark time. Wear your mask or masks, uh, wash or sanitize your hands regularly, maintain social distancing, get your vaccines, protect yourself and others around you. Help us move forward into a new normal, whatever that is, but a better normal than what we are experiencing now, which seems like it could possibly get much worse. Instead, do your part to help us move forward. Get us open again, get us functioning again, get us living as God intended us to live in the abundant life of Jesus Christ. Finally, be kind to everyone you come into contact with today. Everyone has lost things and gained things during this pandemic, but we're all struggling in, in some way and trying to find a way forward and figure it out, figure out where our place is in the new normal. Be a person who encourages others, be a helper, be kind. And now let us receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.